Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, this is, uh, I'm not sure how many, this is number 29, I think, of the calls that we've had. Um, uh, this is the 11s um, for CICMQ. Um, this will be recorded and put on the YouTube channel, which is, um, which is now uh, filling up. We've had 265 views of the videos um, that we've put on there now, so these are um, proving to be um, pretty popular. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and pull up, uh, pull up what we're going to be talking about today. Very pleased uh, that we've got um, Yvette Gray, who's country manager for the UK and Ireland for Atradius, who are um, not only corporate partners of the Chartered Institute, but uh, they are also, um, also clients of CICMQ. We were just about to go for it um, when, uh, when the whole lockdown thing uh, started. So um, we're gonna be looking at how we're gonna do this and we're probably gonna be one of the first ones that we're gonna go take a crack at doing this whole thing remotely if we can. So uh, we're looking forward to doing that. So um, this is um, using debt collection agents, um, hints and tips. This is from, um, from Yvette and Atradius. So uh, what I'll do is, um, given the, some of the slides, uh, the text on the slides is a bit small, so I'm gonna go full screen, okay? Um, which may mean you might need to move the, move the people bar around a little bit so that you can, uh, you can read some of the slides, but I'm just gonna go full screen. Um, so hopefully everybody can see that. Okay, um, Yvette, over to you. Thanks, Chris. And uh, I should say to support me is uh, my head of operations, um, Justin. Um, he's, uh, he's my very detailed numbers guy. So whenever any numbers come on the screen, you can uh, rely that, that Justin is going to be there to take over and, and talk a bit more sense than I can. Um, Fantastic. Everybody needs a geek, don't they? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Justin, for joining. Um, so, uh, I mean, when Chris first asked me to do this, I did think, uh, you know, I mean, I've got to know quite a lot of you, I think, a bit better already from um, joining these calls regularly. And I did think, well, you know, they all know what they're talking about. So what, what, what really can I add to them? So um, a lot of what I'm going to talk around today is, is actually quite common sense. Um, um, but I'm hoping that um, just by sharing a bit of our experience um, at Traders Collections, that perhaps some of it will resonate with some of you. And um, hopefully um, some of it might give some of you something to think about and at least. So um, should we move on to the, the next slide, please? Um, Chris. Um, so I just wanted to set the scene a little bit, just to, some of you will understand the concept of credit insurance and some of you, some of you will have heard of a trade yes before, but for those who haven't, I'm just gonna give you a, a very quick whistle stop tour of, of who we are and what we do. Um, you might not know that Atradius is, uh, was its original form in the UK, particularly, was established in 1919. And that was at the end of the First World War, and it was actually the world's first credit insurance agency. Okay? It was aimed at stimulating international trade and to give exporters the confidence to, to trade internationally. So um, I wasn't quite around in, uh, in the startup at 1919, um, although Gideon, I think you might have been. Um, um, I was around actually in 1990, uh, that's 90, um, when um, ECGD, as it was called then, was actually privatized by NCM, which was the uh, Dutch state credit insurance business. Um, there were late, later subsequent uh, mergers and acquisitions, um, firstly by Gerlin, and then we've subsequently morphed into um, Atradius. Um, so, um, the collections arm in particular was established in around 1995, okay? It's aimed at, its original aim was at supporting um, our, our insured customers. I mean, the credit insurance policy um, provides obviously credit limits and um, pays claims when things go wrong. Um, but when it came to sort of taking recovery actions um, connected with those uh, overdue amounts and those claims, our customers were felt very isolated and we're having to take the action themselves by using some of our sort of recommended lawyers in any particular country. So in about 1995, we decided, okay, how do we make it more simple for our customers? And I was actually part of the team, as was Gideon actually, um, where we either bought or we created collection companies in our main countries, mainly where our credit insurance entities are. Uh, with the aim to support our insured customers much more. So we would take the burden off the recovery process for them, okay? Um, and also, obviously, we're going to manage our own insured loss ratio much better. So if we then fast forward to today, 
um, we still operate in most of the countries, not quite all, but most of the countries where there is a credit insurance office. And um, whilst you know, our, our main focus and one of our main focus is to continue supporting our, our credit insurance um, sister company and its customers, um, using the knowledge that we've built up over that time, we've, um, you know, we, we've offered services um, uh, right throughout the credit management cycle now. So um, obviously credit insurance, we offer sort of a collect letter service, amicable collections, legal collections. And also in the latter days, we've also now started to diversify into other areas of credit management, um, servicing sort of financial institutes, such as invoice checking services and and over time now we're starting to take over and support our customers more in the dunning process so in a kind of light first party collection scenario so anyway that's so that's just a bit about us and what we do where we come from okay so you can see kind of how we built up our experience over the years and and why we do what we do today okay so if you want to move on to the next um slide please chris great okay so I just wanted to touch base with what we're hearing at the moment. So what our customers are actually telling us. And um, we see two very different approaches actually from our customers. Um, so I've kind of split them into two for simplicity. Um, it kind of obviously is a little bit more complicated than that, but just um, for the benefit of today, there's kind of two different strategies we see from our customers. So some of them are taking more of a cautious approach. So there are those that have um, either reduced, significantly reduced the amount of placements they've, they've made with us. This is both insured and non-insured. Um, or some of them are actually temporarily stopped altogether. And that's generally because they, yes, they want to take a more cautious approach because they tend to be a little bit more concerned with reputation at this time. You know, there's a lot of ethical discussions around um, the collecting stance at the moment. Um, but they could also be restricted um, uh, by legislation or by government um, from placing um, cases for, for collection. Um, I'm thinking of our customers in the sort of utility sector. Uh, I think we had, a, we had somebody talking the other week um, on one of these calls who was in, uh, I think it was in the water utilities. So and we've got um, customers in telecoms and in other forms of utilities. So you know, those ones, I think, are, are generally hit a bit harder and are much more restricted. Yeah, that was uh, Martin Kirby from Scottish Water. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I remember. It was a good talk, actually. Um, so, but speaking to these customers, I mean, they're, they're in a bit of a hiatus position. Um, they, they, you know, they're, 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 so the placements of us to us have stopped or reduced. Um, but they fully anticipate. I mean, this debt does need to be paid. These accounts will need to be paid at some point. Um, so they're fully accepting that, it's, you know, they, they're going to anticipate resource issues further down the line. And they've already started talking to us about what we can do to ease those resource, resource issues. So can we maybe look at taking over perhaps um, a certain proportion of their book and maybe taking over the dunning process for that whole, whole proportion, maybe the, the smaller end of the market, uh, maybe, you know, the, the sort of high volume, low value uh, proportion and take over the whole volume. So that will allow them to, to um, focus maybe on their sort of key customers, etc. cetera. So, um, so those are some discussions that we're having already. Um, but the other side of the customer base actually is they are, they are operating as a sort of business as usual. And, and we're finding probably that they're starting to place even a little bit earlier so these are the ones that actually are more, cash is really their, their issue now, cash is really what they're concerned about, um, and their current resource now, okay? Um, some people who have had difficulties with the transition of working from home, um, and some people, like I say, who are just more concerned about, um, you know, being the last one in the queue, if they don't put the pressure on collecting now, um, then when business gets, gets back to normal, perhaps they might be the last one in the queue to get paid. So, um, you know, so, um, they, they, you know, they're still placing, and as I say, maybe some, sometimes even a little bit earlier. Um, larger companies that are doing that, or smaller companies, do you find? Or... Uh, large customers as well, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, large customers. So it's, it's not just the smaller customers with, with um, um, uh, you know, sort of like the, the real cr uh, crunch in the cash flow, 
there's also the big customers as well that, that, that are focusing on the resource issues now, actually. Um, you'll be surprised how many big companies out there haven't transitioned that well into uh, to working from home. Um, and sort of Justin, we'll go into some of the numbers, but what we're hearing and what we're seeing um, in the placements at the moment is that um, you know um, the placements are increasing actually overall, even though some people are not placing quite so much. But we're seeing larger value cases coming our way. So that's really showing actually that some of the concern and some of the anxiety that's out there about collecting. Um, and those customers that we are collecting from or that are placing um, with us, um, we're having our communication at the moment has to be just, just you know, top notch at the moment. We, we are finding that um, even though they're placing with us, probably we're having to communicate with these customers more um, because they're, they're more anxious about what we're doing. Um, we're keeping them in the loop more. Um, so, so we're really, really trying to juggle this sort of customer debtor relationship because quite often um, there's going to be an ongoing trading relationship in this. Um, and this is kind of what we're good at. This is what we do for our generally for our insure portfolio is that we're very mindful that if there is an ongoing trading relationship, sometimes the customers don't necessarily want us to go in heavy handed. But quite often there's a lot of negotiation. And, you know, we do, we do a lot of our collecting in the amicable phase, okay? Um, but, you know, we, we do obviously escalate to legal where we need to, but, you know, um, particularly in the UK and, of course, in all our offices. I mean, you know, our, our collectors are in the offices worldwide, speaking the language of, of, of the, the, the debtors and, and um, you know, using that local knowledge. Um, so we do try and collect as much as we possibly can in the amicable phase. So our communication at the moment is absolutely key. Okay. Um, so should we go on to the next slide then? Uh, Justin, I think this is where you're going to talk a little bit about the numbers and our experiences so far. Do you want to jump in here? Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, so looking at some of our experiences so far, um, a lot of this was anticipated, but it's, it's nice to see that obviously we measured it going forward so we can, we can map trends to see when we're coming, um, when we're improving or decreasing in, in certain uh, key KPI areas. So the one area we monitor is uh, decision maker um, not available contact. So on average, um, we generally see about 57% of our calls where we're unable to get through to a decision maker and what we classify there is speaking to someone who can pay that invoice. If we speak to a switchboard or um, someone in accounts payable who cannot pay that invoice, then we classify that as unsuccessful. And pre-COVID, we were looking at around about a 57% um, unsuccessful contact rate. Um, and as we've gone through the last 10 weeks, looking at the trend on the, the chart below, obviously that had peaked um, a few weeks back at 85% of our calls, we were finding that we were unable to. Uh, speak to anyone who was in a position to to pay that invoice or give us information around when that invoice would be paid. And as we started to to phase through now into May, um, we can see that we're slowly starting to get back to the levels that we were at the beginning of our working from home process. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'd forecast that maybe looking next four weeks, we would be uh, hopefully in a position where um, we're back down to around about the 60, 65% range. Um, a few other 10 week trends we've looked at as well and then again these are anticipated and probably experienced by a, an awful lot of businesses at the moment we've seen a massive increase in payment plan requests the businesses wanting to spread the payments has increased by 260 percent over the last 10 weeks um number of payments we've received have decreased by uh, 34 percent however we've noticed as Yvette touched on our average payment value has increased by nearly 50 percent um, and what we're finding is we're getting a lot of big value placements a lot earlier than we normally would, where businesses are getting a little bit nervous about, you know, are they going to be able to pay me? The quicker you get through the door, the quicker we're likely to get payments. So we'd, we, we, one thing we've uh, we've noticed a lot, whereas people would normally keep that placement themselves for a few more weeks or maybe a few more months longer, they're sending them across um, a lot sooner than what we would normally expect them. The plus of that is, if it's great for us, you know, we've, Probably during um, the coronavirus crisis so far, we've, you know, our collected sums of we've had our best two months in the in the last six months, and and that's where people are getting a little bit nervous and pushing the bigger values through across to us. 
Uh, insolvency cases as well is an interesting one where there's, you know, we manage insolvency cases on behalf of customers and we've seen a 14% decrease in insolvency cases coming through. However, for me, that's definitely the calm before the storm and I think quarter three, we anticipate that we'll start seeing that new rocket ramp uh, right back up um, going on through then quarter three and quarter four. So do you think that the furlough activity to a certain degree has delayed that? So people have been yes. able to move stuff into furlough, so they're reducing their costs, and then when they start releasing them back again, we're going to see a spike in that. Is that your yeah, view? Yeah, absolutely. I think with, with that, it is the case that these businesses, although they're working on reduced numbers, you know, the insolvency part is not a big focus for them at the moment. And I think when they're back up to speed, we're going to see all them being pushed through to us, in, uh, and we'll see a huge increase in those coming through in the coming months. Right, it'd be great to have you back to 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 find you know sort of June July time and see where that see where these numbers are. I think that would be a very interesting thing to do. Okay, sorry, Justin, to interrupt. Carry no, on. no, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, so I think I'm uh, the next slide. Then I believe we go back over to Yvette on the next yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so again, just sort of touching on our experience. Um, you know, I mean, our advice to to our customers. You know, when um we do always try and operate on a very much a consultancy basis for our customers. You know, we try and advise, you know, how, um, how to best maximize the, you know, the returns out of the credit management process. And of course we do always advise to use data um, wherever possible to, to score customers. Okay. To, to really um, refine your collection strategies um, and wherever possible to, 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 to use automation. And, I just wanted to show you something that we've started doing quite some time ago and, and actually, thankfully, it has, has stood us in good stead because it has reduced um, any stress we've had on the transition of work, working from home because we have so much automation. And, and you must remember that we're talking about high volumes in our, in our um, portfolio. So this is why automation really is key for us. So. You know, quite often we, we advise customers to, to segment their, their um, you know, their customer base. I mean, you could even use, as we've got here, you know, a very, very simple sort of three score, good, fair and poor um, uh, accounts. But what we tend to do um, is we kind of categorize our, our cases that, that we collect out, out on in, into kind of four categories. And you can see here that, that there's a very clear split between where you can automate and where you can't, okay? And, and the automation that we use is, um, is, is meant to enhance actually what our people are doing. So it's to identify those very repetitive tasks that, that can easily be used uh, from automation so that we can put our people on the more complicated, the more rewarding, I would say, um, uh, parts of, of the role. So, you know, we've got that very sort of um, um, uh, clear sort of split, you know, between the, the likelihood to pay um, uh, and the less likely to pay. And then you've got sort of the ones which are sort of category one and two who are very likely to pay either in full or in a repayment plan. Um, and there are some things, obviously, that, that we can do, you know, and we'll, uh, into the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about those tools. Does that, I mean, but when you're looking at the repetitive task thing, yeah. Um, uh, for, for automation it's, it's essentially if you can predict the outcome yes then you know that that's a process that can be automated absolutely and it's, it's more difficult yeah. so if you've got like like disputes are hideously complicated and of course they're not your disputes they're your customers yeah. disputes. Mm. so it makes it even more difficult to, to predict the outcome but if they're paying or it's a payment plan then that's a very very predictable outcome absolutely yeah, yeah. yes um, Okay. And we've got a bit of data here, and um, we'll say we will show you the numbers actually of, of sort of how we are um, using that data. Because again, yes, I mean, well, if, you know, if, when you're looking at volumes, you have to organise them in a way. You can't treat all your cases exactly the same because you just need an infinite amount of resource. Actually, you've got to be very careful, and with that, you need intelligence. Um, so if we go on to the, to the next slide a little bit, um, I, I just want to talk around a little bit around the, the, some of the automation that we're, we're using in this. Um, so just thinking about, um, we've got um, so some dialers. These things have been you know, um, in our system for quite some time. Uh, so we've got a, sort of an automated dialer. Um, and, and some of you guys will actually already have some of these things or, or be thinking about implementing them now. 
But um, the automated dialer can work in two different ways. It can, um, it obviously can work in the background and it can connect as soon as it connects, you know, to the, the number on the other end, it can connect it straight to uh, a collector who can start to engage um, with that, uh, that buyer or that debtor. But they can also work in another way that we've got the automated dialer now, which has the ability to leave um, voicemail messages as well. So that if a collector is unavailable, then of course it can leave um, details of the case um, and um, details of how the customer or the debtor can, can make payment to us. Okay. Then of course you've got um, sort of automated um, denim, which of course with, that goes without, um, you might want to go back one a bit. You've got the automated denim, which of course goes without saying. I mean, a lot of you will have uh, will have those, which again, using the intelligence that you have with the data provided, you can time your denim letters to go out at different times, combining them with your dialers, combining them with your collector calls, dependent on the likelihood of getting payment from uh, and the financial status um, of this debtor. So the personalized video is our sort of latest creation. Um, and that's the video that we're going to uh, we're going to show to you. We've been working with it for a little while, um, and um, again, it's just a way of of moving with the times. I think, and the benefit of this video actually is that with some of the more traditional um, ways of communicating, um, with using the video, we are actually able to capture the digital footprint of the data. So together with the data that we have available on the likelihood to pay, we can also see what this debtor is doing. So we can see if they open the video, we can see if they click through, because clicking through can take them to our website, can take them to our payment portal. So we can see what they're doing. Not only can we see what they're doing, but we can see when they're doing it. So if they open the video um, in the evenings, but they don't actually make a payment, we'll know that maybe actually this, perhaps this debtor is more likely to engage in a call or some discussion with our collector during the evening. So do you know what I mean? It, it's, it's, it's fascinating the additional information that we can get by using non-traditional ways of communicating. Um, so yeah, I'm no, see if we can play it. Yeah, do you want to play it now? I'll see if I can play it, yes. Yeah. So I'm going to stop sharing on this screen. I'm going to go to share screen another one. Uh, think um, let's just double if it may be okay it may not be okay my phone iPad and the airplay um, I'm not sure whether it's let's have a look uh, let's just let's just try oh let's try desktop let's try desktop then I should be able to find the plugin is required oh no okay Cancel. okay I think we might have uh, we might have uh, difficulty in um, in, in sharing it, let's let's see what we can do. Um, escape. Okay, let's. Uh, so we we've got the ability to choose different kind of uh, uh, accents and voices on this video, and I was looking for a really nice Welsh one, which would fit in with my presentation <laughs> quite nicely. But we didn't have a Welsh one, I'm afraid. I need to work on that. Okay, I'm just seeing if I can find that. I did. I did set it up. Oh, here we are. Here we are. This should work. Um, let's hope, hope that this this works. Uh, it's, it's a good. It's a good thing. I, I had a look at it, so it's. Uh, it would be good if we can actually sort of share it. But there we go. Here we go. Okay. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's uh, let's see if we. I'm gonna hit play and see what happens. We're, this is the first time I've done this on the Zoom, so let's see if it works. Dear Mr. Johnson, my name is David from Atreides Collections, one of the world's leading commercial debt collection firms. This video is about your late payment to DuPont. We have been advised by DuPont that this amount is overdue for payment. We have been instructed to collect this debt. We hereby demand immediate payment of the full outstanding debt, including costs and interest. Click here to pay the amount now. If you do not pay immediately, we will continue our collection procedure. The outstanding balance will be further increased by interest and costs. On top of that, we have the option that Atreides Collections will start a legal procedure on behalf of DuPont. In this case, all legal costs will be charged to you. We advise you to prevent any further delay in payment. Pay your outstanding debt today. 
For more information about Atreides Collections, you can click here to go to our website. For 24-7 self-service, we have created a personal account for you. In this account, you will find all the details about this debt. Click here to go to your personal account. For personal assistance, please call Atreides Collections at 0031-529-452-517. Thank you for your attention. Atreides Collections wishes you a nice day. Well, that's interesting. And I think you're right, Tim. I think it would sound better in a Welsh accent. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's interesting. I don't think I've, um, I've, I've, I've seen actually something like that before, which, uh, which is, 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 is interesting. Has anybody else, well, before I, before I reshare my screen, has, uh, has anybody else seen something like that before? No? There's a couple of people shaking their heads. If you have, just do a thumbs up or say yes or... Okay, yes you have, Sarah Aldridge. Yeah, what, what, what have you seen before, Sarah? Oh, I've seen a trade. I've seen that from a trade. Yes, I think it's great. Oh, okay, you've seen it from a trade themselves. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Good. Um. Right. Well, that, that's that's interesting. Thanks very much for sharing that. That's um. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. I've never I've never seen that before. It does kind of um, it does kind of sort of it's it's a different, a very different way of doing it, isn't it? So. Yeah. But I mean, particularly when you know you and it, and it can work particularly well in some good se uh, sectors where we're chasing. Um, you know, the sectors who are likely to be, you know, on their phones, to be pick up these messages on their phones. It's sort of a nice thing to 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 uh, to send to them and engage with them. And it's again, it's about just um, capturing more data as well, because, you know, every time that they open it and they click, we're, we're capturing data on them, on them and their behavior. OK, right. OK. So, of course, you know, the other automation is not just about sort of reaching out. It's about, um, you know, when, uh, um, you know, they, they, uh, they, they want to engage with us with payment. Of course, we have the ability to take uh, card payments um, over the telephone. Uh, we've also got the online portal. Again, it's about streamlining and speeding up the way that, that the, the, they can make payments um, to us. OK, so it's uh, and uh, it's about reducing then our effort of actually allocating those payments to our customers. They can go all the way straight through and we can transfer those payments very, very quickly to our customers, which is our ultimate goal. Hmm. Um, it, um, you say the Welsh accent. There's a number of people that actually said the Welsh accent would be better. Ah, um, <laughs> maybe I'll just have to record whatever, the voice whatever myself. Accent you use just provided it's not an American one. <laughs> 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 yes. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. And the final one there is about escalation as well. We're also looking at automation um, to support our customers when they do want to escalate cases to us. Um, so, you know, we're looking into now and we have actually started building APIs with some of our biggest customers so that they can plug in the rules about what kind of uh, companies they want to, what kind of uh, debtors of theirs that they want to escalate to us, whether it be um, size, whether it be a, a certain age, and that those cases will automatically come across to us. So again, it's trying to reduce sort of manual work for our customers to, to ease um, the, the transfer of cases to us and, and, and transfer of information back to our customers as well. So. Somebody actually put on the chat, uh, perhaps, the, um, perhaps the video would be good with Jaws music in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes pay your bill or get eaten. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. I'm going to take that one back, yeah. Yeah, good <laughs> idea. Yeah. So, the CICMQ best practice community are full of fantastic ideas like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay so if we go to the next slide um, um so this is where i just wanted to show you how a mixture of all those um sort of the the, the technologies um can can really you, you know you don't have to stick to one okay so you can use a mixture of them and then you can use you know you can you can vary them depending on what sector you're trading in depending on what type of uh, of, of data you, you're collecting from so you know you can fit in your personalized message or you know your, your dialer calls into your automated denim and into to your mm -hmm. reminders being sent um you know so i just really wanted to, to, to show you how how a combination of those and this is just one example you know that dependent on how you were to categorize your customer base would be dependent on how you could 
you know, um, how many different contact strategies you would have in place. Okay, so that's that's just uh, an example there. In terms of in terms of systems and automation and stuff like that, is all of this stuff homegrown or is this stuff that you bought off the shelf or? A bit of a mixture. Um, yeah, so our portal um, is more of an off the shelf, but we have modified it for ourselves. Mm. The video, um, we've, we've, we've sort of grown that. We've, we've had a party to help us build it. But um, so it's a bit of a mixture, um, a bit of a mixed bag, yeah. Right, okay, okay. I, I actually, um, when all of this lockdown business is over, I, I'd love, love to come and sort of have a look and see how it all works it'd be interesting yeah sure 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 i'm an ex uh, ex debt collection industry myself some many years ago but uh, it'd be interesting how, how it yeah works. okay yeah okay um all right um so if we go to the next slide uh so we've done that one one yeah okay so we got some numbers justin yeah so uh how we use data um Generally, we use data to uh, define our collection strategies to allocate the workloads to the collectors based on their skill sets. We use them for commercial prospects and also for what well, we try to forecast a bit of predictive collections based on historical data that we capture. The purpose of this slide was to look at, I remember Dan at Cocredo a few weeks ago, uh, he mentioned on how uh, businesses are evolving at the moment to include the post-COVID uh, impact scores. So this slide basically takes on uh, our portfolio, uh, which we well, we try to refresh once a week. Um, looks at the the risk profile of uh, a placement or a debtor pre-COVID versus post-COVID. So the top chart is based on the numbers, and that looks at uh, if we look at very high risk. We had 257 cases that were very high risk 10, 11 weeks ago. Those same cases, or a good chunk of those cases, now has increased to 559, uh, a very high risk based on the COVID impact score. And that'll be multiple factors, um, be the type of industry that, that, that they're trading in, the, the sick codes. Um, so it really allows us to drill down into the detail. This is just a headline step, but there's detail behind there that lets us drill down into those cases so we can say, well, we need to maybe focus on these because there's a huge shift potential in the risk factor to try to maximize the return on the on the collected sums. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the, the graph below then is just the numerical values of the, uh, compared to the one at the top. So you've seen a, a 100%, more than 100% increase in very high risk. Yes, yes, so we've taken those same cases, yeah. and then we said, what is the, the COVID impact score? Um, that's, based yeah. on, that's based on industry and, and the, 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 the credit reference agencies that you guys deal with. Yes, yeah. So we use the credit reference agency for a majority of that data. Yeah, and they, they come back and they, they profile and we just map it against the previous uh, profiles just to see. And then we use it for multiple reasons. For me, it's more for, for my team. We, we build our strategies based off um, the risk profile of the right. data. Okay, that's interesting. Mm, very interesting. It was nice to have because it kind of follows on what Dan was saying a few weeks ago at Cocredo. Mm. Where exactly, yes. The COVID and, scores. And, and there's still there's still an awful lot of, of, of credit checks and stuff going on out there with the data which is still pre-COVID and, and on yeah. all that haven't caught up yet. So that's quite an interesting one. Okay, thanks for that, Justin. It's very interesting, that one. Okay. So I think, um, you know, I mean, going forward, I mean, again, this is, this is just sharing our experience and... Um, you know, it's just to, to give you guys a, a bit of a tip. If you're not data cleaning your ledgers now, I mean, yeah, we would advise you to. I mean, you you can, there are, there are lots of places you can get it out there. I mean, you know, it, it just, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's something that, you know, we would really advise you to do. Okay. So if we go on to the next slide. Um... So I think this is really sort of coming to the end of, of um, uh, what I've got to share with you today. And, you know, there, there's, I mean, a, a lot of this is common sense. And as I said earlier, a lot of it um, you're probably doing already. So, you know, it's, 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 it's doing your research and that includes, you know, you know, your data cleaning, you know, understanding um, the credit risk that, that, that you're looking at. 
And of course, staying close and in com um, communication early. You know, we've talked about this. I mean, I, I'd be interested to hear, Chris, how your session with the AP went uh, yesterday. Uh, because, you know... I'm alive. I'm alive. <laughs> can't be all bad. Um, <laughs> It's communicating, and um, and we certainly appreciate it. You know, as I say, we, um, you know, quite often we're in the middle between um, uh, our customers and the debtors, and you know, it's when those debtors go off the radar and stop communicating, our customers get really anxious and get really jittery, and and, and we it's, it's very difficult to manage. So you know, it, it, it's it's staying in close communication. So again, that's something I would advise you guys to do as credit managers. Is just to stay, you know, uh, communicate early. Um, explore new ways of staying in touch. As I said, you know, we we're at, uh, here at Australia, we were trying to push the bar all the time of new technologies, um, capturing new data. So, you know, I think even Charles mentioned it on his presentation the other week. You know, that there's even using WhatsApp to stay in touch. You know, it's a, uh, and I think who, where somebody mentioned it this week about they were contacted by somebody on Facebook to try and get their credit reinstated. So I would just say, you know, use whatever means you have uh, that's available to you to stay in touch with, with your customers. Um, and without going through too much of them, because I'm, I'm really, really conscious of time and the, that some people are, are needing to leave. But I think probably the one thing I would say uh, practically, aside from all of these uh, sort of measures, is that in general, this if this crisis has done nothing else but actually increased the awareness of good credit risk and credit management in organisations. And my, I guess my one bit of advice, my one bit of parting advice would be to, to it's brought us to the table. It's brought credit managers to the table in organizations. And what I would say is, is you need to practically fight to keep your place there. We're, 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 it's raised a new awareness. And even though, you know, I've always thought credit management's a little bit sexy, it really is now. <laughs> so I would just say, you know, just, just um, if, there, if there's time now where you can, you need to, to, to keep your place at the table, keep raising the awareness of what we do in credit management. Um, and it is so important, you know, the, 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 the cash flow is so important at the moment. And, you know, businesses, quite frankly, will be lost if we're not doing a good job in this sector. So, yeah, I guess that's my bit of parting advice. Great. That's... Um really really good really good i love the numbers um th this is um i think this is another another one actually that you were talking about yeah, yeah. i mean i just put that in on the end in yeah. case anybody was interested in in legal because what we talked about mainly is a sort of um uh, amicable collections you know we are able to go legal and we, we've had um some other people speaking about legal action um, it's a bit of a difficult time at the moment. You know, nobody's really going legal because obviously the courts are in backlog. You can't enforce anyway. Um, what I would say is that it is starting to lift up. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm kept in touch regularly with my colleagues in other countries and, and other countries are, are um, um, starting to ease in lockdown. Um, and so, you know, people are, are starting to see um, things um, moving along. Um, and, and I just put a little link in there as well, because if anybody is interested in the status of the courts worldwide, then I've got the information available. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, so, um, uh, that would be useful. If anybody wants to, um, to, to have that list, um, just let me know. Um, just ping CICMQ at CICM.com. I'll ping you to, uh, to Yvette. Um, and, uh, and and she can sort of share the link with you or, or the website or whatever. I've got I've got the link as well, so I can do that too. Um, okay, I'm just going to um, going to stop the share. Um, so, um, has anybody got um, any questions while uh, while Yvette is is on the line? Looking down the list here. Um, uh, yes, I agree. This is from uh, from from uh, from Tony. I agree. The uh, credit managers um, I know are on a hotline to the CFO more than ever. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. Absolutely, they are. Everybody said that on these calls. Um, apparently, uh, it's good to see Chris take a cup of tea out of the wall. Great magic show. Good presentation. Thanks, Yvette. That's from Charles. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's a good cup of tea as well, by the way. Um, so, um, who else? Uh, who else? Anybody else got any any questions? Anybody? 
uh, Massimo, you reckon that um, music to The Godfather would be a good thing uh, on that video? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, but I guess it's your Italian, right? Not only Italian, but I, I couldn't find much amicable to that video anyway. <laughs> So I guess probably the Godfather approach is probably more suitable to that video. <laughs> okay, uh, has anybody got any any questions there? Okay, what what I would love, um, uh, Justin, um, the, uh, the 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 geek from uh, Atreides. Thank you very much for that information. Um, as I say, every credit function needs a geek, and and at the moment you're it. Um, so um, so in terms of the numbers, uh, very interesting. Those I would very much like to be able to to, to come back to that in say, you know, a, a month's time to sort of see how it's moving. I think everybody would probably find that very interesting. Um, and and it, that, those numbers are, are very, very insightful. They are broadly what others have been saying, um, broadly what others have been saying, although there are, there is a couple of things that, um, that was, that was interesting in terms of the, um, the numbers that some of the numbers that were going up and some of the numbers that were going down, the 260% increase in payment plans was the thing that jumped out and uh, and and hit me when I when I saw that or when I first saw the presentation. So um so so that was very good. Um okay um I'll just um could, could I just ask a question quick question there on the uh, yes. saying you the dialer and the messages that you were leaving. Mm -hmm. Um there's two aspects to that. Um firstly if you're receiving a call and you do go to um a recorded message um, I think people are inclined to, well certainly I am, uh, immediately hit the red button on your phone and, and switch it off simply because you think, well this could be anything, any one of these uh, multiple yeah. cams that are flying around um, about, you know, HMCTS and all the rest of it. And secondly, of course, um, does it also, uh, and I, I mentioned there in a little, little note, does, if you're leaving a message, does that uh, therefore negate your silent call count? Um, uh, which of course you need to collect to, to Ofcom each month um, of the amount of uh, uh, silent calls you deliver uh, when you're doing the uh, advanced dialing. I'm going to ask Justin to answer that one. Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah. No, it, it doesn't get included in the in any of our core counts. Um, so, so you you are you effectively delivering a silent call if if you deliver an answer phone message? Um, are you delivering an answered call so that it doesn't go on your silent call message? Call. Um, we wouldn't classify it as a silent call. Yeah, um, so you have no silent calls then? Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't even know the answer to that. To be honest with you, but uh, no, it, it, we wouldn't classify that as a as a silent call. Um, we send them out with just a bit, it's, it's an information call essentially and like you said the majority of people will probably uh, when we can monitor will we'll hit the red button once you get a call you think it's some kind of sales or insurance call and, and you hang up as soon as you hear yeah. the robotic originally, voice originally the silent calls was to stop was to stop the um, um, the fact that you had a call that was made that uh, there wasn't an agent there to pick it up Mm. Yeah, that was that was the silent call originally. Um, I remember what we had a we had a dial, had a, dial, a predictive dialer back in the, back in the nineties actually when I was at Cable and Wireless, and mm. um and 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 that that was what it was to do to stop the phone ringing and someone picking up. There's nobody there. That was the thing that there was a really big thing in the nineties. Mm. Yeah. So if there's an answer phone, if there's a no answer and it's an answer phone, it's not a silent call as far as I'm aware. Yeah, that's right. No customers answer phone. That's not a silent call. But it, yeah, so. I didn't know how, how serious it was on predictive dialing today. I, I, when I was looking after predictive dialing in a previous role, yes, that was a, a report we needed to run and count and declare each month and yeah. go down your dialer if you're getting too many silent calls on the day. Um, but um, as I say, if you're then delivering a telephone message, then potentially you could run the dialer as fast as you like without ever declaring any silent calls because you're delivering a, 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 an answer, uh, your own answer phone, your own message. Mm. Which yeah, is, I, think, I think that that's... It's spurious in terms of behavior. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if you are, um, yeah, you have to set the speed. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're dealing with thousands of, of, of answer of messages, then it's not it's not an appropriate thing. And I'm sure that the regulator would jump all over you if you did that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And of course, it, as I said, it has to be in cooperation in a in a in a place in a defined strategy for a particular kind kind of business. 
Mm. Um, so it's not a case of, you know, this, this, this business is going to receive 10 messages in the space of half an hour. Absolutely not. It's, it's a part of a strategy, um, which, you know, is essentially to, 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 to place pressure to get payment. And of course, the other, the other side of the coin is, is from, from, from a traders' perspective, they're dealing with clients, the client's debt. So, so um, there is a, a reputational thing that you're going to need to make sure that you can do that any more, more so than another organization would because it's your business. Yeah, so it's, it is set in strategies in the background and it is switched on once a day for a short period of time in the morning. So it, it isn't relentlessly in the background, mm. dialing away all day. Okay, that's good to hear. Okay, any, any other questions? Thanks, Sean. Um, any, any other questions? Okay, um, I'm just going to uh, stop uh, the, uh, the, the, the recording now.